Good morning and welcome to Sunday School with First Baptist. So glad that you're here this morning. If you're watching at 945 on Facebook or if you're watching anytime, I'm so grateful that you've chosen to spend this time with us today. If you are watching at 945, just like we do every week, I hope that you will take a moment to say hello in the comment section. Let me know that you're here and also say hello to one another. I'll give you just a second to do that and then we'll get started. Last week, as we studied together the last days of Jesus, we experienced Jesus' Passover meal with the disciples and the institution of the Lord's Supper. At that meal, when Jesus announced that one of the people who was present would betray him, all of the disciples were incredibly distressed and they said to one another, surely not I. In today's story, we are going to follow Jesus's journey immediately following that meal. So we're going to experience Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're going to explore how prayer is at the heart of what Christ teaches us. So in today's scripture, we learn that after the disciples and Jesus had sung a hymn to conclude the Passover meal, Jesus and the disciples went to the Mount of Olives. We're going to break this scripture into a few chunks today just to make it a little bit more manageable because it is a significant chunk of Mark chapter 14. So we're going to start um, in 14 with verse 26 and I'm going to read about five or six verses. So Mark 14 verse 26. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. So at dinner, Jesus had predicted that one of them would betray him. But the disciples at this point don't know who it's going to be. And as they're walking, Jesus tells them that they will all desert him, but that he'll see them again later. And Peter, who we know is um, often impulsive, he declares, I will certainly not desert you, Jesus. Everybody else might, but it will not be me. All together, the disciples announce that they will die with Jesus if they have to. Of course, we know that that's not quite how the story goes. But we know that there is this sense that the tension is high as we are walking with Jesus and his disciples beyond the Jerusalem city walls. Up to this point, um, we've not quite felt the stress or the kind of impending doom, so to speak, that we're starting to feel now. Now our pulses are racing a bit more, especially because we do know what's coming. It's beginning to feel a lot more urgent than these first few days of this Holy Week have. And so they are headed toward Gethsemane. And we learn very quickly that they have not come there to fight. They have not come there. Jesus has not led his disciples there to uh, defend him in any way, he has led them there to pray, which must have been as surprising to the disciples as everything that Jesus has done and led them to at this point. So we're going to pick up in Mark 14 again, 
beginning with verse 32. And again, I would invite you with any of these passages to listen along and close your eyes. If, um, if you would prefer, you're welcome to read along. But if you choose to close your eyes, I would, I would love for you to picture yourself here among the disciples in Jesus as they enter the garden. So I'll be reading Mark 14, starting with verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Okay, you can open your eyes if they were closed. So... One of my favorite questions to ask, what detail or word did you notice in this uh, hearing or reading of the story that um, you might not have noticed before that you heard or read anew? What detail or word stuck out to you this time? Go ahead and write that in the comment section. You know, it's only four verses, but there is so much happening in these four verses. There's so much emotion. There's so much distress. Um, there's so many parts of this passage. So we'll, we'll take a look at it together. When we think of Jesus teaching the disciples to pray, which he, he says, sit here while I pray, presumably to model what prayer is for them. Most of the time, though, when we think of Jesus modeling prayer, we think of the Lord's Prayer, don't we? That's the kind of the go-to for most of us. But here in Gethsemane, Jesus models for the disciples and for us a much deeper lesson about prayer. Um, a prayer that is offered in much more heightened circumstances than the Lord's Prayer that we offer kind of um, at, any, at any moment. This is Jesus showing us how to pray um, in, not just in distress, but when, when we don't, maybe don't know what else to pray. So as he prays in Gethsemane, Jesus, it's, it says that he is both physically and emotionally moved. It says that um, he is distressed and agitated. I picture Jesus. I don't know what you pictured as you heard that, but I picture some pacing back and forth. I picture some, um, maybe some hand wringing or some uh, hair head grabbing. I, I picture those physical images that we get of someone when they are visibly, physically distressed. I don't know what my hair looks like now that I've done that, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> But Jesus is deeply grieved and agitated. And he even, it says, throws himself on the ground and he cries out to God. Jesus prays in this moment when he cannot do anything else, when his body is, um, you know, kind of out of control. The only thing he does is to pray. And this is not a... Um, just a quick little prayer that he has memorized. Jesus is all in. This is everything he has and everything he is, he opens up to God when he prays. I wonder for you, when is the last time that you have prayed like that? When you have perhaps literally thrown your body down, but if not figuratively thrown your body down and offered every bit of what was going on inside you to God? When have you prayed as if your life depended on it? Prayed with every ounce of your being and just truly opened up your heart to the Lord with complete and utter honesty. 
the fervor with which Jesus prays is matched by his words. Jesus pours out his heart and soul and he says, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. It's a very powerful prayer. We can look at the significant elements of this prayer and and see what it teaches us about how we are to pray. He says, Abba, Father. Jesus has heard his Father's voice. He knows God's voice and he answers God's voice because he knows who God is. And so um, he uses this term, Abba, which we equate to Daddy, a term of endearment for a parent because he knows that he loves him and he knows that God is seeking the very best for him. It's really important that we know the, the God to whom we are praying, that we intimately have a relationship with God so that we are not just praying to some kind of royalty or deity um, that is untouchable, but we are praying to a God who we know intimately and who knows us. That's our first clue in this prayer. Some people, some of you may use the term father when you are praying to God and, and that's probably stems from your, um, your hearing of this scripture. There are some who use the word mother um, because of the idea that God is fully a parent. Still others use other names. I, I don't use either of those actually. Um, because neither of them for me convey even the intimacy that I feel with God. God can't be bound by our human categories, certainly, but the importance of an intimate relationship remains. So I encourage you to consider the names that you use to call God. If Father doesn't work for you, um, as, as many have used it, Um, find another intimate name that you have for God. God accepts that. We're not being told to call God Father because Jesus did or Daddy because Jesus did. It is the idea that we have such a close, intimate relationship with God that we can call God by that intimate name. So, um, Then Jesus says in his prayer, for you all things are possible. This is a prayer of praise and adoration. Um, How awesome is it that with God all things are possible? Jesus is claiming who God is. God, I know you are capable of anything. With you, everything is possible. So the question for us is, do we believe that? When we pray, do we believe that with God all things are possible? Do we believe that God can fully change or move in our lives um, in any way? Sometimes we pray with uh, believing there are limits to God and what God can do in our lives. And so Jesus reminds us to say, with you, all things are possible. And then Jesus says, remove this cup from me. Oh, Isn't that just, um, I don't know about you, but this is one of the most clear moments of humanity that I see in the life of Jesus. Um, Jesus, who is fully divine, has gone about his life um, living so much more above anything that we are capable of. And yet in his last days, he too says, if there's anything that we can do, so that I don't have to suffer through this. Um, Remove that from me. And I think sometimes we're taught that he um, is mostly concerned about his death on the cross, which is most certainly excruciating and terrible and, um, and, and, you know, holy part of our faith. And yet, I can't help but think that he also wants to avoid the emotional pain that he is about to go through, that he is about to be betrayed by 
the people that he has loved the most intimately and dearly in this life. And if I knew that I could, that God could take those types of relationship betrayals away, I would certainly pray that too. And so I do wonder if that's part of what is happening here. That Jesus is saying, hey God, if we don't have to do this, not just the crucifixion part, but this whole thing that's about to play out, we don't have to do it. This, this might be the time. <laughs> and so I wonder how often we really pour out our hearts the way that Jesus does here. Jesus says it is a moment of vulnerability for him, for sure. How often do we do that? Just pour out our complete hearts and admit to God what we really desire the most. I mean, that's a very, very honest prayer that Jesus offers. He is not trying to be intentionally um, holy or specifically um, reverent. He is saying, if we don't have to do this, let's not. That's a very honest prayer. So when do you find yourself offering those most soulful, honest prayers? And then finally, Jesus ends that prayer. And this is, we're still in one verse, friends. He ends that prayer and says, not what I want, but what you want. And there we see Jesus, um, his divinity. We see that Jesus knows that God's will is the best and that God's will is what must happen. He can desire one thing and also know that what God wants for him is the best. Jesus recognizes that everything that we desire is not always good or right. And our hearts and our souls and our lives so often fall short of what God would have us to do and be. So how often do we in our prayers acknowledge that the things in our lives and the things that we desire might actually lead us down the wrong path? That's part of what Jesus is doing here. We hear Jesus, his prayer of praise and petition and confession. And then, this is the key, Jesus adds one more thing. Not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, God, but what you want. What an incredibly humble prayer. And while we might iterate those words in our prayers, how often do our hearts truly mean it? I, I don't know that they always do. This prayer in Gethsemane, a prayer of absolute surrender to the will of God, is at the heart of what Christ teaches us about prayer. Our prayers of praise and confession, thanksgiving, petition, they all assume that we have heard a God speak who is powerful and loving and concerned enough about us to hear our prayers and to answer them. God hears our prayers and answers our prayers because God loves us. If we truly know God's great love for us, can we do anything less than surrender our hearts, our souls, and our very lives to God? We pray because we need to pray. We pray because we need God. We pray because deep, deep down we know our wills are not enough. We pray because we trust that God is enough. And somehow in this moment of surrender, when we have nothing left but our prayers, which is where Jesus finds himself here in the garden, there is nothing left for him to do or say but to pray. When we have nothing left, by the mysterious love of God, we find Christ already there. And we begin to glimpse how to pray. The next section of scripture, still in Mark 14, we're just going to keep rolling, uh, beginning with verse 30, 36 through 42. Again, you're invited to close your eyes if you'd like to listen, or you can read along. Mark 14, verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 37. 
Jesus came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You can open your eyes. When we hear that story of Jesus going away to pray and coming back to find that his disciples are sleeping instead of praying, um, we feel that that is a betrayal that Jesus must have felt. In Gethsemane, Jesus is at prayer, and it is a model of faithful discipleship, of faithful trust in God in the midst of challenge and struggle. And yet the disciples... They fail miserably, don't they? Upon arrival at Gethsemane, Jesus tells his disciples to sit here while I pray. He then takes his three closest disciples, we heard a little bit earlier. He takes Peter and James and John a little farther into the garden with him. And he confesses to them that he is deeply grieved about all that's about to come. And he asks for his closest friends to remain and stay awake. Now, to keep awake or to keep watch, the Greek word that is used here to describe that, Jesus uses this word um, that we translate as keep awake or keep watch, but it really is referring to a life of vigilance. Um, It's not just a one-time thing. It's saying, like, you, you need to be alert throughout your life. Your entire being needs to be alert. We're not just waiting on somebody to show up. We're having a vigilant life of keeping awake. This word indicates that um, it's like a faithful watchman who is serving on his or her uh, master's behalf. The watching is very active. In Gethsemane, Jesus pleads with the disciples to keep awake, to watch with diligence, and to act on his behalf while they wait. He presumes that these three best friends of his will also follow suit in their prayers. As they hear him pray, surely they will pray the same thing. Surely they will honor God. Surely they will ask that God take this cup from Jesus, and yet they sleep. No one is capable of doing what Jesus has asked. Three times, and we know that that number three is significant here in our scripture, three times Jesus asked them to stay awake, and three times he returns to find them asleep. Jesus asks us, his disciples, to keep awake in the middle of our own lives, in the middle of all of the things that are going on around us. We have our own Gethsemane moments. So what does it mean to keep awake, to act with vigilance as we wait for Christ's return? What do you think? Go ahead and answer in the comments. What do you think it means for us to keep awake and to be vigilant? What does that look like for us today? Go ahead and answer that. A life of vigilance and keeping awake might include public action of some kind. And yet keeping awake might also include some unnoticed acts, some smaller things. But we do know that if the disciples are to keep awake, they must pray. Prayer fuels vigilance. 
because if they're not praying, they're falling asleep, right? They're falling asleep to what is around them. In Gethsemane, Jesus prays and the disciples sleep. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus encourages his disciples to keep watch several times so that they don't fall victim to temptation. Stay vigilant. Keep watch. And so we are called also to watchful, active vigilance in our own time. So my question for you to consider, are you sleepwalking? for lack of a better word, through life and through your faith? Or are you praying and are you an active and vigilant watcher on behalf of Jesus? What would it mean for you to be vigilant as we wait on Christ? I'd invite you to consider that. You don't have to answer it in the comment section, but I'd invite you to think about that today. And then we will finish today, I think this is the last set of verses that we have, with Mark 14, beginning with verse 43. So again, you're invited to close your eyes or read along. And this is, um, I think this is where we will close today. Mark 14, 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. The lot here, right? After Jesus returns the third time to find that his disciples have not been keeping watch, Judas arrives with the crowd of chief priests and scribes and elders. Now, unlike the Gospel of John, where the crowd consists of soldiers, here the mob consists of these people of the temple. And they are led by Judas, who is identified as one of the twelve. Eleven of Jesus' disciples sleep, and the remaining one leads the mob. Judas is not referred to here by his name, but he's referred to as the betrayer. He's arranged a sign to identify the one that they are to arrest. The one I kiss is the man, it says in verse 44. Jesus will be betrayed by a kiss. Forty-seven times in the Old and New Testaments, we find reference to a kiss. Apart from the accounts of Jesus' arrest in Gethsemane, the references to a kiss are either an intimate gesture or they're a greeting between family members or fellow members of the church. Several times, the Apostle Paul even encourages the church to greet one another with a holy kiss. Judas takes this intimate form of friendship and relationship And he turns it into an act of betrayal and ultimately violence. Sorry, that makes me breathe a minute. (laughs) Jesus is betrayed by someone who knows him so intimately that he would greet him with a kiss. Sorry. (laughs) 
when Jesus arrives, uh, or sorry, when Judas arrives, he calls Jesus rabbi, again, indicating that Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends. However, not everyone seems to recognize that this is Jesus. This arrangement has been made so that um, everyone will know which man is Jesus. So is this why Judas uses the kiss to identify to the mob that this is the man they're going to arrest? Does Judas worry that the chief priests and the scribes aren't able to pick out Jesus in the dark? This part's a little curious to me. Um, it, it tells us that it's likely that those who've come to arrest Jesus don't really know him. They don't really know what he's done or what he's about because he needs to be picked out in the crowd. And we remember that Jesus is from Galilee. He's not from Jerusalem. But he has been teaching openly in the temple. We know at least during this week he's been there almost every day. But how many have really spent time listening to him? If he's been teaching openly in the temple and they still need help identifying him, then surely they've not actually heard what he's been saying. It's quite possible they needed Judas to identify him because they didn't know him. Jesus reacts to the kiss and the mob with indignation. One of those who stood nearby cuts off the ear of the high priest's slave. And while this episode is included in all of the Gospel's accounts of Jesus' arrest, Mark just barely mentions it in passing, so we're not going to spend a lot of time lingering on it today. Jesus doesn't address the offense or he doesn't heal the servant in this passage. Instead, he says, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I've been teaching in the temple and you didn't arrest me. Let the scriptures be fulfilled. After praying and surrendering to God's will, Jesus acts with intention so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Just as Jesus predicted, all abandon him. All, including ultimately a young man, it says, who's wearing a linen cloth. It sounds like maybe there is one man. We, we're not sure if it's one of the twelve or another disciple who, who kind of sticks around till the very end. But as they all flee, someone catches hold of the young man's cloth and even he keeps running naked. That's one of those verses we don't spend a lot of time on. <laughs> he runs off naked. Who is this young man? What is his story? This is the first time we've met him in Mark's gospel. Whoever he, he is, though, he flees with the rest. So abandoned by all and in the possession of a mob, Jesus remains the single model of faithful obedience. He's the only one who has prayed. On the other hand, the disciples still fail miserably. They fail to watch. They fail to pray. And then they fail to stay. They flee. And so the question remains for each of us. In the moment of trial, of our own trials, of the world's trials, of the trials of our faith, who will we be? So your homework this week is to consider, how do you respond in a moment of crisis in your own life and the life of those you love in a crisis of faith? Would you step out and act or might you flee and betray what God has called you to do? We're going to close today with a breath prayer. Some of you have done this with me before. Um, but instead of a prayer with lots of words, we're going to close today with a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. We will inhale and say the words, not what I want. And we will exhale and say, but what you want. 
and allow the fullness of those words, the richness of that prayer that Jesus taught us to fill your spirit today as we close. Please pray with me. Not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. Thank you so much for joining me for our Bible study this morning. Um, I want to say I'm sorry for getting a little teary, but I'm not really sorry. <laughs> it threw me off guard. I wasn't expecting it, but um, the stories of Scripture can do that to us, right? They can, they can stir in us emotion um, that I think God can honor in those moments. So thank you for receiving that today. I will let you know that next week we are still going to be in Mark 14. We're just trucking along with those last few days of Jesus. And so we will be in Mark 14, beginning, picking right up where we left off with verse 53. And then we're reading a chunk, friends. We're going to go all the way to 1515. So if you want to read that this week, that might help you as we uh, study it next week again. Mark 14, 53, so just right where we left off, all the way through 15, 15. So we are getting closer and closer to um, the final moments of Jesus' life. We will be next week looking essentially at the Good Friday story. So I invite you to do that with me. And I so look forward to our time together each week. I thank you for your faithfulness in studying God's Word. And if you have any questions or prayer requests, don't hesitate to let me know. And we will see you. Um, oh, I will say this. Don't forget that Wednesday night at our midweek time, which will be both streamed online or you can come to the prayer garden at 630. We will be sharing in a moment of reflection about this past year, um, honoring all that we have gone through in the year, the one week or one year anniversary of our COVID-19 season. So we'll have some ways to mark that significantly. If you would like to join us on campus, 6.30 on Wednesday, we would absolutely love to see you. So I hope to see you there. Also tune into Facebook this week and we will have a few prompts for you to consider throughout the week as we commemorate um, all that we have gone through in the last year. So that's all I have.